Hey guys, on today's episode, we're going to see a clip from Matt Walsh and Jordan Peterson talking about therapy, listening, and whether or not we should be teaching and telling people what to do, or we should be listening more and how to get real change in the people's lives around us. Jesus said that sometimes the children of this age are wiser than the children of light. So we believe there's a lot to learn from what Dr. Peterson says in this clip uh, to apply to discipleship, how we listen to people in the church, and how to really help people grow in the Lord through discipleship. How many therapists are likely to actually say to a patient who comes in who's depressed or anxious, how many of them are likely to say, well, look, put the smartphone down, stop watching pornography, uh, you're overweight, get, you know, start, start eating healthy, get some exercise, get some sun, go for a jog. Uh, well, you will well, say that, okay, but well, okay, well, how, how many are willing to say that? Well, I would say, generally speaking, saying that is not helpful. Now, let me, tell, let me explain why. So, if you go see a physician, a physician is very likely, or was at least, to, to say those sorts of things if you're obese, you know, lose some weight. The problem with that is people don't. And the reason for that is that it's, well, because they're already set in their habits. And furthermore, people don't really like advice. In, in fact, if you advise someone of something, they have a proclivity to do the opposite, just to maintain a certain degree of autonomy. Hmm. So one of the things that you learn as a clinician is that it's much the kind of realization that will produce conceptual and behavioral change and hypothetically lead to increased health are the realizations that people come to on their own. And you can increase the probability that people will come to those realizations by just listening to them. So, for example, if you came to me, and let's say you, you were having trouble in your marriage. Well, the first thing I do is say, well, you know, what trouble? And maybe you'd tell me 50 stories about fights you, you've had or are having with your wife. And in doing so, you would start to see, at least in, in potential, what it might be that constitutes the problem and also what you might be contributing to it. And then after that, you might start thinking about what it is that you could do to change that. And if you came to those conclusions yourself, with all the micro steps necessary to understand why that conclusion was necessary, and in some ways incontrovertible, you'd be way more likely to initiate the changes. And th this is partly why therapy is somewhat of a time-consuming process. Advice just doesn't work. Now, there were times in my therapeutic practice where, for the sake of speed, and maybe in relatively dire circumstances, I would offer my clients advice. But you want a little of that goes a very long way. And it's also partly because you don't want to steal someone's destiny. So imagine, imagine you came to me and you were having some trouble with your wife, let's say, or your career. Let's say your career. It makes it a little less personal. And I, having listened to many people who had trouble with their career, I offered you a solution to a problem that you had with your boss and you went and implemented it, and it worked. And you might say, well, hooray for that. But I would say, no, not hooray for that, because I just had success in your life. And that meant I robbed you. I robbed you. Because that was your problem, not mine. And this is something to know even with children or with people that you love, is that people have their destiny. You know, and that destiny... You can be there as a, you can be there and walk with someone as they traverse the route of their destiny, but it's not up to you to, to fix it. You can't. People won't let you anyways. Like, it just doesn't work. And behavioral psychologists really do this. And 
It's one of the things I admired about the behavioral tradition is behaviors learned very early that it was very, very, a very difficult matter to set the circumstances up properly so that people would in fact implement changes, even in small things. So what you're doing when you're practicing therapy properly is you're allowing people to have the time necessary to speak because in speaking they think and if they think they actually often figure out what the hell's wrong with them and what to do about it but they need that time especially if they're in dire circumstances and often people just don't have that now you know i still have some qualms in some ways about the therapeutic relationship because you would hope to some degree that people would get that opportunity for communication by from their friends and from people they love maybe from their priest in in a functional religious society and then you could ask well can that be substituted for by a paid relationship and i would say well there's obviously some danger of conflict of interest there but but you know you can do good things imperfectly as well and it was certainly the case that many of the people who came to talk to me had no one else to talk to ever and that talking was extremely good for them bro every i feel like when i listen to jordan peterson that verse just rings in my mind that's uh children of this age are wiser than the children of light hmm yeah, I just I thought this would be a good learning lesson for discipleship and disciple makers. Totally. There's a statistic I heard actually at the beginning of this week, which was only one out of 10 people who decide to follow Jesus actually keep following Jesus for the rest of their life. You might say, oh, well, that's just a result of people's choices. And sometimes maybe but but maybe it's a result of us being decision driven mm. to where it's like oh we just need to get people to the decision so i'm going to tell them and tell them and tell them to do this thing enough to where then they make the decision to follow jesus and it worked for me so yeah. it ought to work for someone else and i i also know that um i came from kind of this idea that the problem with the decision that was made was the pre-work on the front end, you know? Yeah. Um, that you didn't give them the right gospel. And if you gave them the right gospel, that would have kept them. Um, and, and, it, and it's only been recently, probably in the last year, that I've really been open to a totally other school of thought, which is it's, it's actually on the back end. Yeah. It's after the decision and the discipleship that comes after that that is the problem. I mean, make disciples of all nations. Uh, yeah. And I think, but I think that there's both. I think there's yeah. a little bit of both. There's, there's some front end work that, you know, people don't understand the decision they were making. And then there's some back end work that yeah. they didn't get helped after they made that decision. Well, and that's what Peter Sin was saying in his clinical practice was there is be circumstances to where he would in, in dire consequences or dire needs of uh, times of need, he would give, a bit of advice, a bit of what he thought. And he was saying that that little bit of advice went a long way. And I think sometimes in discipleship, we think it's all about information mm -hmm. where it's like, Hey, we just give them all this information. Once they have the information and once they understand it, then they ought to follow it. You see this a lot of times with, you know, street preaching kind of scenarios. Yeah, so true. Dude. Where it's like, I go to the gay pride rally and I, tell them all the information. I show them Romans one. Here yeah. it is. It's unnatural and unclean. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that will be what is, uh, enacts the transformation is this understanding. I even think of like when I was a youth leader, it's like my kids in middle school, I had middle school dudes and it was never about the information. Almost the, never. The information isn't what they needed. They needed an older, guy to show them how to live and to to spend time with them you know yeah and just listen and for them to ask questions and answer as best as i could but also more so what i what i realized was people don't change because of new information they change because of revelation 
and revelation comes through self discovery mm-hmm. or the holy spirit let's let's add in the yes. the more gospel presentation of the uh, peterson's idea the holy spirit revealing to to them not you and so the idea i had for why we should watch this video and relay is i think a big problem in discipleship is we often try to help people get them their eyes off themselves but instead of having their eyes go to jesus and that personal yeah. relationship and that self-revelation their eyes go to us and we we're like okay that's good enough you know i have i have this quote from uh from uh soren kierkegaard actually of all people one must approach from behind the person who is under an illusion instead of wishing to have the advantage of being oneself a christian one must let the prospective captive enjoy the advantage um Anyway, I'm butchering it by reading it. Basically, what he's saying is you can't teach people from out in front of them. Mm. You have to come behind them and basically make yourself hum- more humble than them and bas- make them pretend that they're teaching you. And that's how you actually teach somebody is you come behind them and ask the right questions and have them in the space of the teacher. And that's yeah. how they realize instead of leading them and teaching them, and I think that that's the um, really fundamentally how I know this is true is because of the law. Mm. That was what the law was. It was teaching. It's the right thing. You know, the law is holy and just and good and it's it teaches you what is good, yeah. but it does not change people. Okay, so I thought you were going to say, I know this because Jesus asked more questions than anyone else. Totally. Okay, well, and then, <laughs> and then the, the flip side of the law... I know that this is true because the law didn't work and Jesus had to come and be people's friends. He had to actually display what God was like in living color, in living flesh and be friends to people. Yeah. So instead of the law, Jesus had to, um, that verse from the very end of John chapter one, it says the law came from Moses and, uh, but Jesus brought life and truth. But actually, in the Greek, that word but, that conjunction but, is not in there. Moses brought the law, but Jesus brought, as though the law was not grace and truth. Yeah. But actually, that conjunction is not in there. Moses brought the law. That was great. And Jesus brought something even better that the law could not bring. Not that it was bad, but it just couldn't do what yeah. Jesus did, which is be a friend. Yeah, I, th- I think what he said about uh, the the listening is so powerful and when when someone's there to listen to you and then how sad it is that there's so many people in this world who don't have those kind of relationships where someone wants to say hey how what's going on in your life like and will be a listening ear and won't just tell them what to do and it may be my stubborn self or you could say it's the sin of rebellion in my heart or something you could say that <laughs> But I don't like being told what to do, really. Like, no. I don't like, I don't, and and it doesn't seem like most people, I guess some people maybe, you know, they like the simplicity of it. But I would say most people. But even what Peterson was saying, even if you enjoy the simplicity of it, you never become wise. Right. Real discipleship is me trying to turn you into a wise person yourself, not turn you into a robot or a good Christian. Right. If I hammer you, and make you a good Christian from the outside externally with rules, you never become a wise, you know what I mean? Like one day I will die and you have to figure out how to parent your kids alone yeah. without my external rules guiding you all the time. See, that's what's so interesting about that statistic of like only one out of 10 people who dedicate their life or start following Jesus actually end up doing it for the long haul. Yes. It's so interesting because I think that is the real like when you take the you know thousand foot view back from the church, that's the real fruit of the church right there. I feel like hmm. is is that because so often we're we're micro view instead of that macro view where we're like we had this many people make decisions for for yeah. Jesus and all this stuff and we're like we're doing it right we're we have the Lord's favor but then you take a step back and you're like and you're saying the fruit of the church is the other nine yeah hey hey if you want to look at our fruit the fruit is nine out of 10. Exactly. That we do not disciple, that we do not. And that it's but we like, market the one or actually we market the 10. 
Oh, yeah. And that's right, right. the problem. We market the 10, but our real fruit is the 9. And, uh, you know, the real fruit, the, the spiritual fruit that we do produce is the 1, and that's awesome. Um, but we market the 10 as though that was what was going on. And really, you know, and I think things like uh, your job takes you to a new city, and now you're away from your pastor and you're away from your community that was making you good, squeezing you to be good yeah. on the outside, but there was you never internal. learned wisdom on the inside. Mm. But And that is the aim of true discipleship, is that you would become wise. You would learn how to listen to Jesus. You would learn how to navigate the Bible and and glean that wisdom for yourself. Yeah. Um, I think of Paul, you know, he said, I did not come with persuasive words of wisdom. Yep. And so often I think we take, and I don't want to just keep going down this, this, this hole of like, we're, we're, you know, we're doing everything wrong. Like the goal is to find and, and emerge with, Hey, how can we, take this face on but the pro like i think first off you we gotta, g- we gotta face our problems yeah. right you know and so is it oftentimes we what was i saying <laughs> uh i don't remember okay i i have a different point maybe it connects we uh we take church membership as enough or community engagement as enough as long as that person's coming the door filling oh. a seat or coming to small group and all i think that's ministry bro i but was it's, but it's not like and my question is how do we get out of this mechanical way of doing things i because it's sitting, easy oh you were there with me at the church conference when oh, okay. they were talking about metrics, tracking metrics in your church. And they're like, how do you track discipleship metrics? I was like, that's a good question. I hope you tell me. And it was still, but it was still, I mean, they said like decisions yeah, and then baptisms. And then, and then they said like, um, still pe- things, people being baptized. And, but Quantitative, I, every, not every qualitative. step in the way I was like, yeah, but those are all things external that you can count. Yeah. How do you count? You can't. I you cannot you, quantify and discipleship. That's what I'm talking you about. cannot quantify wisdom. Well, I don't think you can quantify it until the until the deed is done, until a life has played but out. But even how do you quantify that I'm parenting better? How do you quantify yeah. that I'm I'm growing in wisdom and how to disciple disciple and discipline my kids? Maybe that goes down to our so our our, our saved centric culture where it's like, well, it's are I you saved? Data centric. I think it's data centric. Mm. We, if we are going to collect data to talk about how well we're doing, you have to have data points and right. you can only collect data points on external things. You can't collect a data point on whether I'm learning how to evangelize my coworker. So the question is, do you think it comes down to motive at all? Because like we know this more as much as anybody else, you collect data points. What? So you can tell people how good you did. So what? You can raise more money. Is that it? Maybe. Okay. I think it's just, you know, in business, in the secular world, yeah. you can collect data on lots of different stuff because you're not dealing with people's insides. <laughs> yeah. You're totally dealing with money and outsides and stuff like that. And so we, I think we take data principles from the world instead of saying the thing that we do here in church cannot be quantified. It's, it's well, at its most important aspect, it cannot be quantified. You have to do it with your two ears. That's the only way to tell how you're doing is to sit with another human being and use your two ears. Hmm. How are you doing? And life. Are your kids doing okay? Is your marriage doing okay? How's your job? Are you, you know, tell me about that. And, and, and not in a dry way, not in a way that where I'm trying to collect quantitative. Right. Well, I ministered to three people at my work this week and I only blew up at my kids six times. I'm not looking for quantity. I'm looking for quality. And that can yeah. only come with my two ears and a real friendship. So, so you mentioned in discipleship, it's kind of about the disciple kind of believing or feeling like they're teaching or having the opportunity to be kind of the teacher. Um, but that's not, you're not saying that in a manipulative way. You're saying that I'm genuinely yes. coming and interested in your life and want to know you, want to know how you're doing. How can I And help? also understanding that that's just how it works. Yeah. Like Jesus says, uh, remember he goes, um, 
he goes, somebody asks Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, what do you think? And the guy goes, uh, love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus goes, great, do that. And the guy goes, "Uh, who's my neighbor? And instead of answering the story, or instead of answering the question, Jesus tells a story, the Good Samaritan, and then Mm -hmm. asks another question. Who was the neighbor to the man? The guy goes, "Mm, the one who showed mercy. Go and do the same. That whole exchange was based on the other guy actually telling Jesus the answers. Okay, that's fascinating because that would insinuate that we know right and wrong in our in our hearts and everybody does and to just make you be honest about it right to you come out with the honest answer and there is a so space it's not about information that they don't have they it, there know. is a space for te- teaching i think there is a space for teaching yeah um but ultimately the discernment should come from honesty and letting the holy spirit touch that thing inside of you that honest conscience you know yeah. and then you responding to it rightly uh, I think you could use the um, the rich young ruler opposite. You know, the rich young ruler asks Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus responds, well, you tell me the commandments. Have you done all these? And the guy says, well, yeah, I've done all those, but I still don't have it. Mm. And Jesus, and then there's the teaching moment. Okay, here's the answer. Go and sell all you have. But that, But it's always, Jesus is always passing the ball back. The ball is in your court to answer. The yeah. ball is in your court to be honest. The ball is in your court to, to be vulnerable. Something. The ball is in your court to respond to your conscience. And, and Jesus had to know enough about him, enough about what was in his heart. You know, how often are we, it's so easy for us to just like, okay, come on, little disciples, you know. Like we we I, we were both in uh, college ministry. Mm-hmm. And so we had college dudes that would come in into our homes and or we'd meet at a park or or wherever and hang out and how often is it that we just prepare our lesson and you know and teach it and watch it sail over people's heads yeah exactly (laughs) call that discipleship so how do we become better disciples and how can we take some of what peterson is saying and apply that yeah, I so here's here actually you said emerge we need to emerge into something right. Yeah. And I think I just feel like even in this past week so many different threads have been coming in that discipleship for Gen Z and even millennials but for for these younger generations discipleship is the way of the future because people are so desperately hungry for that honest vulnerable relationships. Yeah. You know, and to be called higher and to grow in wisdom not just not just from a talking head but from a real friend because there it's so lacking in every other area of life. You know, older generations, you might've had the lions club or you might've had the, right. The Masonic lodge. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you do, you know, but, but you've got these like civic relationships and now you work from home and you know, you just, you don't take your coworkers seriously. And it's so hard to build friendships. The discipleship in the church is the way of the future. People are so hungry for it. But in college ministry, that is one of the things that I, I saw as a real problem is young people get the opportunity to teach and they want to teach. Yeah. They want to show how wise they are by leading out in front and teaching people and instead of asking questions and instead of making a friend. Well, I think that's been positioned as the valuable thing. Like we have been told, like our, the story is, Oh, you, this is the minister. This is the person that is doing all the good work for God. I think YouTube and TikTok make it worse. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Here's the guy with views, the guy, the talking head. Totally. The talking head gets views and not, yeah. Um, so discipleship is the future, but discipleship in a way that is not based on teaching, but is based on listening. Well, I think about Jesus. It says, you know, when it's prophesying about uh, Jesus and Isaiah, it's like he had nothing to be desired. Mm. Like he wasn't, and then Paul again said, "I did not come with persuasive words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power." Yeah, it's like we need to keep in mind. I think the key to the discipleship here is not only just listening in like a psychological way of how it unravels people's ideas and thoughts, because people can come to so many different conclusions, 
but it's partnering with the Holy Spirit to actually get to the heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get to the heart of what's going on yes. in the person's heart. Like there's so many things that people are holding on to or have hidden or haven't unraveled and will show up tr- looking for answers in the church or really looking for a friend yeah and won't find it even when we'll they think they're over. looking for answers yeah they're really looking for a friend <laughs> well they're looking for that problem to be solved yes right that pain to be reconciled and like i've been walking with the lord since my sophomore year of college and you know everybody has their path and and you know we're the church is constantly reforming and growing and different things like that. And, you know, there's personal responsibility here, but a lot of some internal trauma from my childhood and things like that is just now getting fully worked out. And, you know, maybe that happens forever, but maybe it could have happened sooner. Hmm. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's ways to actually connect to actually have fellowship yeah. with people in a way that the early church did, sharing their bread with one another, yeah. you know, praying, gathering in prayer together, actually knowing people. But I've had that sim- similar experience where five years into my Christian walk, the Lord says, you know the reason why you struggle with this? is because when you're in middle school, you believed this about yourself or you believed mm-hmm. this about people. And it... Whoa, yeah. where did that come from? And some of that stuff is so deep. I think the whole point is it's so deep in there. You know, these lies we believe about ourselves, the lies we believe about the way the world works, it's so deep in there that it can't be done any other way but by the yeah. slow process of deep friendship. And it's not like you could have sped it up. You just needed to have that those deep friendships and those... Um, deep times of ministry that only come through the hard work of really being friends. Yeah. You know, uh, there's no other way around it. You just have to get there, but you have to get there the slow way through friendship. Well, I think that's probably oftentimes why marriage is so difficult for people is because a lot of the times that's the first time that they are getting to a place with someone they're in relationship with, a friend, their spouse being their friend, that vulnerable, that open, and and yeah. having those type of conversations to get deep and to work out those things. And a, a lot of times there should be other people, you know, whatever gender you are, someone of the same gender, ideally, yeah, to be a, a friend to you yes. and to, to be walking through those things before you jump into a covenantial relationship. And it's... If you're there, that's okay. And that's part of why God brought you to that relationship yeah. is to bring you more humility and to learn. And, and that's what's so beautiful about that. But you got to seek discipleship. Yeah. Like a real friend who's going to do that good listening with you. And I, and I like how, how he ended the clip where he said, you know, could a therapist do this? I, I, I came from a place where I was like, no therapy, no counseling. Yeah. It's all whack. It's not even Christian. And, you know, my, my, my younger sister, I think I've said is, is a therapist. And so she helped change my mind on a lot of this stuff and just watching people go through therapy and, and have it actually be beneficial for them in some ways. Yeah. Um, I was like, okay, therapy is good, but I didn't, I didn't go all the way. I said, therapy is good, but a good Christian friend is best. A good Christian friend is, is best. And then if you don't have that, probably just a good friend <laughs> And yeah. then probably, and then probably a therapist, um, but a good, wise Christian friend with two really listening ears is probably best. It is fascinating that Jesus asked so many questions. Yeah, you know, yep. often it's like, "What would Jesus do?" And I was, I've been talking about lately. It's like we should have bracelets that said, "What did Jesus do?" Just look at what he did. Because if we're followers of Jesus, yeah, Christians, little Christs. That was a slander in the first century. But uh, why don't we just look at what he did? 
Yeah. It, it's very difficult for us to get over our <clears throat> stubbornness and our traditions of how things are done. And when things are modeled for us a certain way, it's really easy to just be like, oh, yeah, that's the way to do it. This guy had an impact on my life, and now I'm doing what they're doing. Yeah. And it just seems like time and time again, it all comes down to the true meaning of discipleship, hmm. which is you allow your life to be interrupted by someone else for the sake of them. Mm-hmm. And that's what it means to truly love your neighbor is like, it's not fun to go knock on your next door neighbors and bring them cookies or whatever and start a relationship or invite them over for a meal. That's not easy. I mean, that is super hard for me. And awkward. Yeah. Yeah. I am. (laughs) I am not. I'm not good at small talk. Yeah. So those like opening conversations, (laughs) like, what do you do? Where are you from? So really (laughs) difficult for me. Yeah. But gotta make a friend but that's even that listening part we're talking about because i'm the same way where i'm like why are we wasting our time with all this stuff but that's meaningful to some people yes like and we don't realize that so many people are lacking that in their lives even that simple thing yeah like where are you from what are your siblings like how'd you grow up yeah i remember conversations on campus where i'd ask a question that i thought was fairly simple and they're like you know i've never been asked that before it's like, or, really? Yeah, or you ask a simple question and people just spill their guts. And you're oh, like, yeah, yeah. oh, I am just here to be two listening ears. Yeah. You do not you do not need answers right now. You need a friend. And I have just I think that's the that's the charge. If you have never done that before, I've I've given this charge to to young ministers in our college ministry before. If you have never done this before, try your very hardest to spend an entire hour only asking questions to somebody (laughs) yeah and if they ask you a question back give 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 a short honest answer but then pitch it back all try to have an entire conversation for an hour where you're only passing the ball asking questions don't teach don't don't answer don't say your two cents don't say what you think just spend an hour asking questions and you will watch people just open up in front of you like a flower. Yeah. It is cr- it is the craziest thing, you know. And it, it, you just it made me think of like I, I thought of this uh, guy Jack that is one of my friends and was a disciple, um, and we have an awesome friendship. And he was just there, you know. He just wanted to be a friend, and that's like our friendship of just hanging out and being friends. It like really impacted his life, and. You don't need a program to do that. You don't need a microphone. You don't need a podcast. You don't need to go to seminary. You don't need any of that. You need the Spirit of God guiding you. You need to pray. Prayer is important. But ultimately, it's like, what what does it take for um, the world to to encounter the gospel of Jesus, it takes you just looking for that one person to be friends with. You don't have to have eight people coming over to your house for a small group to be successful or home group or, you know, whatever you want to call it to be successful. Just one. You just need one person. Just one. I will f- we'll probably finish with this. The transformation happened in my discipleship when I, did exactly what Jordan Peterson said not to do. I I got a huge head and I thought that I would go around teaching people, telling them what they ought to do. And then that would attract a whole <laughs> bunch of people who saw how smart I was and I would be surrounded by people that I could teach, 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 teach. And I watched this one guy. I kept I kept telling him. I kept telling him the right thing to do. And he just like, and I watched him zone out and zone out and zone out and grow distant and distant and distant and distant until he left my life. And I, and, and like, yeah, I just went, I have done something terribly wrong. And probably a couple weeks later, I met this other guy and I just committed in my heart. I am not going to do that. I'm just going to be his friend. I'm going to have an open hand. I'm not going to try to teach him. And it took a lot longer. It probably took just as many, just as many months as it took to drive that one, that first guy away to draw that second guy in. But by the time that we were really friends, I didn't have to teach him anything. He would come and be like, bro, this is going on in my life. 
And he would ask me, what do I do? And I, and I, and I found myself imparting wisdom, you know, and, and helping him realize what was going on in his life. Um, but only after the far end of that hard work of friendship and that, that has formed the basis of a new way of doing things mm. of saying there's got to be a rapport there's got to be a trust there's got to be a, a desire to grow and to yeah. be wise and and that commitment to investing in somebody in a relationship and not as i was reflecting on this i realized jesus said call no man teacher mm. you have one teacher the messiah you are all brothers and it, and as long That's as I so want true. to be called teacher, I'm doing something very wrong. As long as you want to be elevated above <laughs> someone else, you're if, not a disciple. Of if Jesus. I want to be the wise one in the room and be called teacher, I am I am doing the antithesis of, of what, what Jesus, Jesus said. Did. Yeah, be brothers. Yeah. When I am aiming at being brothers, there will be wisdom imparted, and there will be a growth in wisdom collectively. Yeah. Um, but you got to aim at the right thing. Or, or you'll never get off the ground. I need to study Jesus's life. You know, we got four accounts of it. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to pray? Yeah, let's pray. Uh, Father, would you just help us listen more, ask more questions, and talk a little less? Probably. <laughs> um, we're just grateful that we get to serve you, Lord Jesus. Will you refine us? Would you search our hearts? Um, for everyone that's listening uh, to to look at how you lived and, and what you did and to model that in our relationships, to be satisfied in the simple relationships around us, be satisfied in that being our impact, that that being our treasure that we impart in becoming true friends of people. And... Um, making true disciples of you with humility and insight and being led by your spirit. We're just grateful. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thank you for making it to the end of this episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to give to the podcast, you can give at divinecreative.org and that link will be in the bio and on our channel.